Welcome to the Virginia Education Center for Asphalt Technology. This is the Asphalt Plant Level 2 class, and in this module we're going to cover the components of asphalt mixes. So what do we hope to, for you to learn as we go through this class, or this module? What materials are used to produce an asphalt concrete mixture? What are the physical attributes of an asphalt concrete mixture? What types of mixes and binders do we use currently in Virginia? What is the basic aggregate and asphalt properties that we look at? And we want you to become familiar with common asphalt volumetric terms. As we go through future modules, we'll get into more detail of what these volumetric terms mean, but also how do you test for them. So, what is the materials that we use in Virginia. Well, in our mixes, it's asphalt cement, it's the binder, it's the glue that hold those rocks together. It's about four to six percent of the total mix. If you're in some of our mixes, like an open graded drainage layer, we specify around four percent minimum to be used. You can get into things like our SMAs, it might be six or seven percent. So it depends on the mix, but it's about 4 to 6 percent of the total mix by weight, about 10 to 12 percent of the volume. Binds everything, it provides cracking and rutting resistance, and some of this binder that we account for comes from either recycled asphalt pavement, and very rarely, but there are some mixes that use recycled asphalt shingles as well. But the wrap is a big component in much of the state, and most of our wraps contain five or six percent binder in that that helps with the new mix. We also have aggregates. So about 94 to 96 percent of that weight comes from aggregates. So 94 plus six is 100, 96 plus four is 100. That's where all your weight's coming from. You also have air voids. Some mixes may have some other additives that play into this, but vast, vast majority of the mixes is binder and its aggregates. It's about 75 to 85 percent of the volume because again you got cement, you also have air that goes into that. We have fine aggregates, so if you hear the term what's the fine aggregates, it's that material that'll pass the number four sieve and the screens. Coarse aggregate is that stuff that's retained and larger. So your number four material, or a three-eighths, or a half-inch, or three-quarter, or one-inch size rock, those are our coarse aggregates. And again, of the aggregates that's in that mix, some of it may be coming from your wrap or your RAS. And for a lot of the mixes that do use wrap, some upwards of 30, base mixes up to 35%, you have a combination of coarse and fine aggregates. In Virginia, we follow pretty much the super paved nomenclature, but we do have some twists on it that means stuff in Virginia that may not mean as much in another state. Each state seems to have a little bit different protocol. Our convention is XX, that's our, sur our type of mix. So is it a surface mix, is it an intermediate, or is it a base mix? Then we have number, number, period, number. And those numbers designate the nominal maximum aggregate size. Thing to keep in mind, even though Virginia doesn't use the metric units, we do follow the metric nomenclature for our aggregates and our super paid mixes. So think of it, let's go backwards. 25 millimeters is one inch. 19.0 millimeters is about a three quarter inch stone. 12.5 is a half inch stone. 9.5 is a 3 eighths. The 9.0 is pretty close to the 3 eighths. And then the 4.75 is a 3 sixteenths. So this is the nominal maximum aggregate size, and we'll get into that a little bit later. And this last, the Z, just designates either the binder type, an A, D, or an E, for super paid mixes, or the performance binder grade if it's using an SMA. Commonly with superpave, what you'll see is our SM95A or SM95D or SM95E. And each one of those just goes back to what the final, the final binder mixture grade is. 
What are there binders that we use in Virginia? Well, we use performance grading. We follow what's known as the massacre system. PG just means performance grade. The dash dash is the temperature in Celsius. Maximum average pavement temperature for seven days. Basically, it's to make sure that if it's experiencing very hot temperatures for seven days, it won't rot. We also have the X, so it's the traffic loading. S, H, V, and E. This goes with the massacre, which is a test that's done at the binder lab. So this is the lowest amount of truck traffic. E is the heaviest amount or extreme truck traffic. Then we also have the minimum temperature. So the minimum one day pavement temperature is expected to experience. We're looking at that for a low temperature cracking. Most of the state, based on the super pave binder system, minus 18 degrees C. We don't expect to see a day colder than that. All binders come through the Virginia Asphalt Acceptance Program for a company to be able to ship liquid to Virginia to be used on a VDOT job, they have to be in the asphalt acceptance program. And VDOT contracts designate the binder to be used or the final binder grade when co combined with RAP and RAS. So it's many of our mixes use RAP, very few use RAS, but if you think about the amount of RAP, the RAP has aged binder in it. It causes that total binder in the mix to get a little stiffer, a little harder. If it's tested, so you pull the wrap binder out and the virgin binder out, it needs to be, in many cases, like a 64 minus 16. So in the contracts, we designate what that is, and that is in section 211. Common binders that we see most often is a 64S22 and the 64E22. A lot of the S is used especially for lower volume roads, but also when it's combined with wrap because it hardens, it'll meet a 64H minus 16. We do use the 64H minus 22 when we need a D mix, but we have less than or equal to 25% wrap in the final mix. And you see this more in the western districts where there's not as much wrap as compared to the urban areas. S is a softer binder. So this corresponds back to pre-massacre testing or MSCR, where we've just called this a 6422. The H is a little harder. This would be our 70 minus 22. And our E, if you think in the old nomenclature, would be our 76 minus 22. Our interstate mix, or where we have lots of heavy traffic. Our aggregate, so what are we looking for aggregate-wise? Well, what's our size and our grading? Because that impacts how stable the mix is. Also, what the void structure will be. So, if you take the rock and you combine them together, do they interlock and make it stable as well as minimize but not eliminate the voids that's in that material? We're worried about the soundness. We don't want the rock to break down. We do a test called LA abrasion just to make sure that as that rock is exposed to traffic that it doesn't crack, that it doesn't disintegrate. We look at absorption, so how much binder is absorbed into that aggregate. So if it has a lot of absorption, you may design a mix with 6% asphalt, but if half a percent gets absorbed into the aggregate, then really all you have left is an effective five and a half. For that mix to produce and perform, you may have to run instead of six, six two or six three, accounting for the absorption. So what other aggregate qualities and properties do we look at? Well, we look at binder affinity. So does that rock like water or hate water? Is it hydrophilic or is it hydrophobic? And the reason we need to know that is that when it's coated with asphalt, what happens in the presence of water? Does it strip? Does that bond break down between the aggregate and the binder? We lose stability, the material comes apart, and we lose the pavement structure. So we need to know, does that rock like it? Now by VDOT specs, we require anti-strip in all of our asphalt mixes. To the, basically as an insurance policy, not all of our aggregate strip by 
putting it in there, then it's an insurance policy. Yes, there's a few dollars possibly more paid, but it's a whole lot cheaper than having us get into an aggregate that does strip in the presence of water. So we want to know the affinity. We also need to know if that asphalt or the rock in the asphalt will polish. So when it's subject to traffic, does it become smoother, lose the skid resistance and cause safety issues? Limestone or aggregates with high calcium amounts tend to polish. So basically by spec, everything that's classified as a limestone is treated as a polishing aggregate. Whereas our granites, our trap rocks, our dye bases, and we got other aggregates with silica, they don't tend to polish. So under traffic, they keep their micro texture, they keep the rough edges, they don't tend to uh, get smoother, and we don't have the skid issues for safety. So now let's look at the mix itself. We've talked about the binder, we've talked about the aggregate. Let's talk about the mix as we put everything together. We got voids in the total mixture, voids in mineral aggregate, voids filled with asphalt, and then we have fines to asphalt ratio. And these are all characteristics of that material that we find through lab testing. In your book, you'll see this page. This is a table out of the VDOT supplement. But here we have our different mix designations. These are our production voids in total mix. So as we're producing and you're testing it as a level two, for this 12.5A, are you between two and 5% air voids? We have the voids filled with asphalt during design, but now that we're in the production mode and as a level two, does it fall within this range? So that 12.5, is it between two and 5% on the voids in total mixture? Does it have a VFA between 68 and 84? Does it have a minimum voids and mineral aggregate of 15? And is the FA ratio, the fines to effective asphalt between 0.7 and 1.3 and that's just taking the total number of 200s divided by the PBE or the effective binder is that between 0.7 and 1.3 and we do all this testing at 50 gyrations so when you pulled that sample out of that truck you brought it in you prepared it you stuck it in the gyratory mold you put it in the gyratory compactor it compacts for 50 gyrations and then we pull it out of the mold and we do the testing. So here's the table, a couple notes down at the bottom. 4% is what we're doing for design. So here during production, we're between two and five. For A and D mixes, we do it at 4%, but for the E mixes, we do it at three and a half percent. Again, that's what the mix designer needs to know. As the level two, you're checking the production numbers. Voids in total mixture. Basically, we're looking at the air spaces that's in the mix. And it's these little pockets, so as hard as you try, you can't get all the air out of that mix. Even completely flooding it may leave a few air voids. A flooding of a binder may leave a few air voids. So that's what you're testing, is how much air space is left. On that previous table, I showed you for 12.5A it was between 2 and 5%. So now when we take that material, we compact it, are we between 2 and 5%? We need the air voids because you've got to have some space for that material to move around, a little bit excess binder to move around, but if you have too much, it'll lose stability, you'll end up with rutting, you'll end up with flushing. So that's why those Percentages are set in those two to five is set there. In the lab, we're at two to five. On the roadway, we're not going to get the same level of density. Two different animals, two different compaction efforts. In the field, we're looking between five and seven and a half percent. So this will be 92.5 to 95 percent. In the lab, you're looking at 95 to 98 percent. We got voids in total mixture. Also tells us about the durability. So how well it's gonna hold up over time. If the air voids are too low or too high, low air voids leads to decreases in permeability, keep water out and reduce oxidation. But if it's too low, 
it'll lead to stability and possibly some flushing. If it's too high, the air voids are interconnected. It allows air to go through the mix. It allows water to go through the mix. That could lead to stripping. It can lead to oxidation and lead to premature failure. So we need to make sure that we have in the mix when we compact in the lab good air voids as well as when we go out into the field. And density air voids are really interrelated, the inverse. If I say I've got 5% air voids, means I got 95% of my density. Five and 95 equals 100. So the higher the density percentage, the lower the air voids. Sometimes it's helpful just to look at all of this in a schematic of all the different volumetric components. So here's our compacted specimen. You can see the black outlines are the asphalt, the clear areas are our air voids. If we pull all the asphalt out and all we're left with is air voids and rock, we think of that as our voids and mineral aggregate. We take it the next step, our VMA really is a combination of air voids, the asphalt, compared to our total aggregate makeup. So it's just different ways to look at the volume of air. Air has volume, it has no weight. Asphalt has volume and weight, just like our aggregate. So there's our air voids in this scenario. Let's look at our voids and mineral aggregate. And these are those spaces between the aggregate particles. You take the binder out, again we look back at this here, we have all the binder pulled out and it's just the rocks and the air voids. So that's the voids in the mineral aggregate. Is the space available to accommodate the binder? You don't want it too low because then there's not too, enough space. If you have it too high on the other end, even though by spec, if you remember that table, we had a minimum. If it's too high, it can make the mix again unstable. Higher the VMA, more space available, which increases durability. So we're looking for enough space between those aggregate properties to get the binder in there, to get the film thickness, so we have higher durability. What we have to be careful of is not too much binder is added that takes us and starts pushing that aggregate apart, makes it unstable. Minimum VMA. Again, it's for durability purposes. So there we're talking VMA. The VMA is related back over to the asphalt and the air voids. And now we start looking at voids filled with asphalt. So the total voids that are in there. What of those voids are filled? The number's too high, means there's too many voids filled. Again, we lose stability. Too low, we probably don't have enough asphalt, but there's a good correlation between durability and VFA. Goes back to our percent density. So that's why we measure and we record VFA as well in the lab. VFA is too low, there's not enough binder, probably don't have enough durability, you're not going to get good density, and we're going to see it's going to be prone to fatigue failure, it's going to be cracking. If it's too high, VMA is overfilled, lose stability. So you'll see some projects that may have rutting. It's nothing to do with the subgrade or the layers below it. It could be the VFA was too high on that mix and it's densifying and it's squeezing it out. It's making the mix unstable. You got what's known as plastic flow. And again, what we're looking at is the air voids and the asphalt in that total mixture. So now let's talk about FA ratio. FA ratio is just another, we group it with the super paved volumetric properties, but it's really just a calculation of how much um, minus 200 material you have in the mix compared to the total asphalt. And do you have a ratio that provides enough for coating but not so high that you're not coating the aggregate or so low that you may have stability issues. So we look at binder thickness as a way around of looking at FA. So of all the rock 
How well are they coated? How thick is the coat? We want to make sure that we, there's plenty of binder to reduce premature aging and moisture damage. So it's another check. If it's too high, it means that there's a lot of fines. Fines have more surface area than, say, a half-inch rock. If it's absorbing or taking up surface area with the asphalt, we don't have good coating. We have low uh, film thicknesses. But you have to have enough 200s in there to make a mortar or to make a mastic between the binder and the 200s to give that mixed strength. It's an indicator of coating and it's simply calculated by the percent passing the 200 sieve for a lot of the super paid mixes probably around five or six percent divided by the effective binder. And that effective binder is the total binder minus the absorbed binder because there's binder gets absorbed in the rock, maybe stuck in the wrap that never gets utilized. So what we're concerned with is the amount of binder left coating the surface. So there is a calculation to determine effective binder content. Some other things, we need to know the percent binder just to do some calculations. Effective binder for the volumetric calculations like that FA I just showed. Mixed gravities, we needed to calculate volumetric. So we need to know what the rice value is. We also know during the mix design what the aggregate gravities are. TSR is very important and mix permeability is. The PB, this is the percent binder in the mix and that varies depending on what the mix is. If it's got a base mix that has lower than a surface mix, fine graded or an SMA, they all have different binder percentages so we need to know what it is so we can control the mix during production and we can monitor it. The optimum depends on things such as the gradation, absorption of the aggregate. So all these things play into it. It's important that the mix designer has a handle on what their aggregates are, what the properties are of the aggregate as they put this together. Remember, finer mix gradation, higher total surface area, therefore greater amount of binder required. Two mixes, a 9.5 and a 12.5, made with the same parent material or the same rock, the 9.5 should always have more binder in it than the 12.5 because the 9.5 has a little bit more fine aggregate. The finer the aggregate, the more surface area. So remember that. The finer the mix gradation, even a IM-19 designed on the fine side or the coarse side will have different AC contents. The higher the aggregate absorption, the greater amount of binder required. Contractors, when they have the opportunity, try to stay away from that absorptive aggregate because the most expensive part of the mix is the binder. And if you have to increase the binder content because of absorption, you may make your cost or your mix cost ineffective. So it may be cheaper in the long run to go to a quarry a little bit further away that's aggregate doesn't absorb as much because you need less binder. But again, that is business decisions and that's the things that the mix designer must look at in putting together their mix. What is the effective binder? So again, there's the total, but then the effective is the amount of binder not absorbed by the aggregate. So it's effectively that bonding film. So if you have absorptive rock, the more it absorbs, the more total binder you need that impacts the mix itself. And again, binder effective is just total binder minus the binder absorbed by the aggregate. Very simple calculation. We got mixed gravities, we have bulk gravity, and we have maximum gravity. So we have these bulk gravities. This is basically refers to the gravity of the mix compacted compared to that of water. So you take that mix, you compact it to 50 gyrations. It's going to have air voids in it. What is it compared to water? Water is 62.4 is the unit weight of water. So you look at that gravity that coming out of that bolt or out of that pill and you compare it back. Is it higher or lower? It's going to be higher than water 
Is that value 2.6, 2.65, 2.7? The maximum specific gravity, again, you're comparing it back to water, but it has no air voids in it. Zero air voids. So it's 100% asphalt and rock. Maximum gravity must always be larger than bulk specific gravity. So if you run a test and the bulk specific gravity is higher than your maximum, something's wrong. Either your max gravity is wrong or your bulk gravity is wrong. But the bulk can never be higher because it has air voids in it. And this one does not. At 77 degrees water, specific gravity of water is one gram per cubic centimeter. So that is a reference. So if we're out in the field, we're trying to keep our water at 77. In our lab, we're trying to keep it at 77. A typical mixture's gravity is between 2.3 and 2.5. The maximum is typically between 2.4 and 2.6. The reason being is the specific gravity of asphalt is right around one, just slightly more than water. So this is one. Asphalt's just a hair higher, 1.07, depending on uh, the source. So when you look at the GMB and the GMM, this has rock in it. So if 6% of your mix is at one, the other 94% is going to usually be between about 2.4 and 3.0. So you do the math and that's where these values come from. They don't hold true in all instances. It really depends on the specific gravity of your rock itself. But remember, GMB's always got to be less. If it's not, you've made a mistake somewhere. TSR is just a measure of strength loss. Goes back to stripping through freeze-thaw. We run that test. We use it to look at long-term susceptibility of that mix to water. Does it hold together or is this a plate material that breaks down? Again, to, affect, to counterfact it, we do anti-strip. That can be uh, lime. Uh, in many cases, it's a liquid anti-strip off a VDOT approved list. But either way, you've got to meet a value of 80%. That's done during mix design and then we actually test it in that first lot to ensure before we send a lot of mix out that it'll meet the TSR value. Permeability, again we want to make sure that as we've compacted the mix in the field and these surface mixes, air and water won't flow through. So really it's a check on our gradations, how well it goes under traffic. We don't want to push water through it. We don't want interconnected air voids. If we do, water gets in there and think about it. Water's trapped and now you got a moving load, what's going to happen? It's going to cause that water to want to expand. It could cause that aggregate and that asphalt bond to break. And if it breaks, we have premature failure, cracking, raveling. So we do a surface perm test during mix design, but it is not required during testing. But we want you to know about what that is as part of your level two. So with that, there's some knowledge checks at the end of your chapter. Take a few minutes, go through those questions. The answers are in the back of your book. And if you have any questions, ask your facilitator or moderator. Thanks a lot.